Yeah. Okay. Here. Okay. So language arts. That's got to go away in a minute. Okay. Um, workbook, or I'm sorry, student book, lesson four, categorize. <clears throat> okay. So still get some more people coming in here. So I'll wait for them to join. Oh, it popped me off my screen. Okay. Oh, okay. I see what it did. Now this should go a little better. Okay. So for you guys who are just coming in, just so you know, we're on uh, lesson four, categorize. And this is following along a lot with like what we did yesterday. Uh, so for this lesson, we're gonna define that term categorize, and then we're gonna categorize information into broad or narrow groups. Uh, and it, it's, you know, a lot more sort of that critical thinking idea. How do we sort of categorize stuff? How do we put it in a pigeonhole with other like things? Uh, and it goes back to that uh, summarizing or sequencing, all that sort of helping building those skills that you can um, use to, to pick apart passages. All right. And no doubt we got a little bit of audio. Categorizing can help you organize information into groups. You can sort various elements, such as people, events, places, and even texts into groups according to their similarities or differences. Categories may be broad, such as regions of the United States, or narrower, such as foods that contain vitamin A and vitamin B. Yeah, so it's, you know, it's a pretty straightforward idea here, right? It's, uh, we're just looking at how we organize information into groups. Um, what makes sense when we do that? And, you know, of course, something to consider there is going to be how broad. Uh, and it makes sense as you go along and you start reading the passages. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look here. All right, very similar to what we've been doing, right? We get a passage here to take a look at. Uh, and again, uh, like I keep stating, always take note of the title. And that's going to that's going to tell you that 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 eliminates so much, right? When it comes to categorizing, already we know we're talking about voting in the United States. So who votes in the United States? It says the Census Bureau released data showing who tends to vote in the United States. Some of the results are not surprising. Age, sex, and education are all reliable indicators of national voter turnout trends, according to the report. And Americans vote more, on average, when a president is on the ballot. But buried in the report are some revealing tidbits. Minnesotans tend to post among the highest general election turnouts in the nation, uh, including a whopping 79.2% in 2004. Residents of Texas and West Virginia, on the other hand, tend to occupy the lower end of the voter participation spectrum. In the 1996 presidential elect election, for example, uh, voter turnout scarcely hovered above 50% in both states. Uh, certain motifs are constant uh, regardless of who is running in a national election. But surprisingly, perhaps age is often a predictor of whether someone will vote uh, and older Americans are most likely to show up to the polls, while voters ages 18 to, 9, uh, 18 to 29 are the most disengaged. Voters' behavior varied by race, too, with white voters most likely to cast their ballots and Hispanic voters most likely to stay home. That pattern does not hold in some of the swing stakes that could help decide the presidential election this year. Uh, so this is from one thing about a lot of the, the Steck Vaughn stuff uh, in the in the Paxson program. It's starting to age a little bit. Uh, so that goes back to 2012. Uh, your data from this past election is going to be quite a bit different. It's a, it had this historic turnout. Right in that from time to time. Um, anyway, so looking at our underlined sentence up here, uh, our text box says, you know, the first line refers to data about who tends to vote. So we know uh, from that statement, you know that you're gonna be categorizing voters. Again, just like you know, I was talking about with the title, all right? We're already clued into what uh, this 
data and uh, the information entails. And our next little uh, text box says this paragraph, the words age and race describe categorize or, or categories of voters. Um, these categories predict how likely someone is to vote. So, you know, I mentioned before with uh, transition words and signal words, if you're categorizing information, um, that's the type of thing you're going to look for, right? Um, in, in, in that same sense as a signal word, you'll look for things like age and race. Uh, that's how they're, you know, they're separating these uh, classifications by age and race. Uh, the title is a, is a signal to let you know what we're categorizing. Okay. And that's the lesson. So we'll scroll down. We'll get into the yeah, lesson four quiz. So unit one, lesson four, categorize. Give everybody a second, make sure they're caught up. All right, then we'll hit start. Okay, and the same passage here that we just read. I don't think at least our first question is going to deal with that. Our little text here says, when reading, you may come across an item or an idea that you think belongs in a category. Uh, clues from the sentence can indicate the current the, the correct category. So context. We're starting to uh, see ideas about context, and that's going to come up a lot too. What's the context of the sentence? What's the context of the paragraph? which goes along with the idea, you know, the topic sentence and the supporting ideas. All right, so our first question here. So the author places voters ages 18 to 29 in an age group most likely to vote, B, an age group less likely to vote, B, B, B as in boy, right? An age group less likely to vote. So one is B and it says that, Right, right here, right, just to point that out. Well, voters ages 18 to 29 are the most disengaged. All right, so answer one is B. Number two, oh, and we have a new passage here. So let me get through that real quick. So Americans are taught from an early age that there are four basic tastes sweet, salty, sour, and bitter. But what describes the taste of chicken soup? To an increasing number of chefs and food industry insiders, the answer is umami, dubbed the fifth taste. First identified by a Japanese scientist a century ago, umami has long been an obscure culinary concept. Hard to describe, it is usually defined as a meaty, savory, satisfying taste. But now in the wake of breakthroughs in food science and amid a burst of competition between ingredient makers to create new food flavorings, umami is going mainstream. Packaged food companies such as Nestle, Frito-Lay and Campbell's Soup are trying to ramp up the umami taste in foods like low sodium soup to make them taste better. <clears throat> While the nation's mushroom farmers are advertising their produce to chefs as an ideal way to get the umami taste. <clears throat> but now in the wake of breakthroughs in food science and amid, uh, oh, whoop, I'm starting over. Fourth paragraph, the food industry is embracing umami as part of an effort to deliver highly flavored foods to consumers while also cutting back on fat, salt, sugar, and artificial ingredients. At the same time, more consumers are scrutinizing food labels for chemical sounding words and un unhealthy ingredients. To understand the taste of umami, imagine a perfectly dressed Caesar salad, redolent in parma of Parmesan cheese, minced anchovies, and Worcestershire sauce, or slurping chicken soup, or biting into a slice of pepperoni and mushroom pizza. The savory taste of these foods and the full tongue coating sensation they provide is umami. While umami is a relatively new concept in this country, it has been well known in parts of Asia for nearly 100 years. It was identified in the early 20th century by Kiku, Kik, Kikune uh, Akita, or Aikeda, uh, a Japanese scientist who coined the name umami. 
using the Japanese term for deliciousness. He found the foods with, with the umami taste have a high level of glutamate, an amino acid and a building block of protein. Mr. Ikeda developed and patented a method of making monosodium glutamate or MSG, a processed additive that adds umami taste to food, much as sugar makes things taste sweet. <coughs> so that's from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, so question here, question two, why is umami categorized as the fifth taste in this passage? Is it because Japanese have different taste categories? Umami is new, healthful type of food and needs a new taste category. C, the artificially created taste of umami do not fit the natural taste categories or D, Umami does not fit into the four basic taste categories. What's correct there? Is it, a? it is D. Umami doesn't fit into the four basic taste categories. So D is in dog. All right. All right. Same passage. <clears throat> also, according to the author, the taste of umami best fits within uh, A, the salty category, B, low sodium, C, savory, or D, chicken soup. B? Um, C. C. Yeah, C. C. The other ones are basically, you know, salty is its own, um, you know, one of the four kind of tastes. Uh, and the other ones are more uh, descriptions of what well low sodium is what they're trying to make the umami flavor uh put into low sodium foods and then chicken soup is an example of that so it would be a savory category so c is savory four in paragraph five the author helps readers understand the taste of umami by uh, a describing tasty foods that fall into the taste category B, naming all possible food combinations that contain it. C, repeating how delicious umami can taste. Or D, recommending pepperoni and mushroom over other kinds. C, C. It's four, we're on four, right? Uh, it's A, he just describes a number of the foods, right? So he talks about chicken soup. Uh, and they talks about a Caesar salad mm -hmm. with Parmesan anchovies. So, um, yeah, he doesn't name all of them, right? And he doesn't, um, you know, he does recommend pepperoni mushroom, uh, not over other kinds of pizza, but he recommends that as an example. So, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a broad sort of general uh, description and category that he's using here. Uh, so it's A. Okay, and then the final one here for the quiz. So how does the author categorize, categorize foods? Um, with the umami taste. So uh, is that A, they contain high levels of MSG, B, they contain high levels of glutamate. C, they are rarely packaged or processed. Or D, they are basic Japanese dishes. B. It's B. Yeah, B is in boy. Okay, and we'll submit. Here. So a quick review, one is B, two is D, three is C, four is A, five is B as in boy. Okay. All right. So we'll switch over to the workbook. 
So give everybody a second here to catch up. Make sure you're on lesson four, workbook, categorize. And yeah, just uh, stating the same thing here, you know, most people categorize or organize different types of objects or ideas every day. Uh, so they might organize a shopping list by supermarket sections, such as meat, dairy, or cereal, or they might put various kinds of tools, such as hammers, wrenches, and nails together in a particular place. I know when I try to make out my grocery list, I do so by how I'm going to wind up going around the store, right? So I don't have to go back and it never fails because I usually wind up having to go back anyway. Um, <laughs> But, you know, we, our brains just kind of work that way. We try to categorize things a certain way. Um, you know, we humans, we, we like order. Um, you know, we, 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 we like a sense of order. So categorizing for a lot of us is going to be intuitive. Um, all right. So, okay. A new section again. Um, and this one going with voting trends. So going back to the idea of voters we're dealing with and voting trends in the United States. So the Census Bureau, as well as private polls studies tracks voting trends in the United States. One discovery, not, all, not at all surprising, is that older citizens, particularly those over 65, vote more regularly than younger citizens in the 18 to 29 age range. One reason is mobility or conversely, stability. Voter registration in the United States is tied to voter residence because older voters change residence less frequently than younger voters do. Voter registration for older citizens remains the same. They are permanently registered at the same address and do not have to think about registering before an election. Younger voters, on the other hand, tend to move more often. Whether they join the military, go away to college, move to another election district or to another state, they tend not to remain in one place as longer as older voters do. Therefore, younger voters must think about obtaining absentee ballots or registering in their new place of residence. If the state does not have election day registration, then new residents may not register within the appropriate time frame and thus not register at all. When attributing causes of low election day turnout among younger voters, researchers and pollsters should consider that residence-based voters registration systems is in some part responsible for the situation. And uh, it's advising us with our text box here. So the author's main idea often identifies the key categories being described or compared. Uh, here the author refers to older and younger citizens, right? So there's our, our comparison between two different groups. And secondly, uh, down here, it says the first sentence, which is the topic sentence, and contains the signal phrase, on the other hand, tells you to expect contrast. Uh, here, the author provides important information about younger voters. So, yeah, you know, I've mentioned this several times. We've talked about the signal word thing. <clears throat> another, that's another phrase, on the other hand, just like nevertheless, but however, it's going to signal a contrast. So, you know, that as an introductory sentence, right? Our whole first paragraph, uh, well, we start talking about older adults after, after the, the, the topic set. So we get some information there. And then we're moving on to the second one. And it says younger voters, on the other hand, tend to move more often. So and in contrast, now we are contrasting older voters to younger voters. So it's that little signal to look for, give you a little pause, make your you know, brain switch gears because you're getting new information. Okay, so we'll start the workbook exercises, All right? Same text we just read there that we're starting with and our little test taking tip. So it says a question may ask how one paragraph supports or relates to another. Identifying the main idea of the first paragraph will help you choose the correct answer. So going back to that thing, you know, find the main idea, uh, make sure you're looking at the title, all of those are gonna help you think about thread, the, 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 the constant thread that runs through whatever you're reading. Okay. All right, so first question here. So to which other category uh, is the age of a voter related? So 
A, B. interest in politics, B, mobility. Yeah. So B, as in boy. For question one. <laughs> And moving on, so the same thing here. So how does the second paragraph relate to the first paragraph? Uh, so in the second paragraph, the author A provides exact details about the registration process, B gives examples of other categories of voters, C explains the situations of voters categorized as younger, or D defines the category a voter age. Either C or D. Or B? It's C. Yeah, C is in cat. So it explains the situations of voters categorized as younger. So that's the relationship, right? In the first paragraph, we get the overall introduction. Then we can start talking about older voters. And then in the second paragraph, we move on and we explain. Um, to younger voters, All right? Okay. All right, so here we go. On to number three. Okay, back to umami. So new section here. Again, taking note of the title, we know what we're dealing with here is going to be about umami. So for home cooks, umami can open up an entire pantry of ingredients. Just ask, just as a few shakes of salt can improve a dish correctly, uh, a correctly applied dash of cheese, wine, or even ketchup can pump up the umami without overwhelming the dish with the flavor of the added ingredient. Cook skilled in umami can reduce the fat and salt content of foods without sacrificing flavor. There are several ways to boost the umami taste in a meal. One is to add ingredients rich in glutamate, such as Parmesan, even a rind tossed into the soup pot deepens flavor or other types of aged cheese, soy sauce, tomato products such as juice, paste or ketchup, and fish-based sauces like Worcestershire or uh, in uh, Thai fish sauce. Uh, another is to use foods high in certain nucleotides, another compound that contributes to the umami taste. These include many kinds of seafood, mushrooms, and meat, especially veal and stocks made from bones. For a more powerful effect, cooks can combine from those two categories. For reasons scientists don't entirely understand, when glutamate is combined with certain nucleotides, the umami effect is magnified. Finally, cooks can build umami flavor through technique. In general, any process that breaks down protein, including drying, aging, curing, and slow cooking, increases umami. This is because glutamate, normally bound up in proteins, is released into a form uh, the tongue can per perceive as umami when proteins are broken down, says Chris Loss, a senior culinary scientist at the Culinary Institute of America in St. Helena, California. <clears throat> okay, so here we got a little drag and drop to do. Uh, and it's asking us, what are the four umami rich foods into the web? So we got this little rope here. We want to look and find the four that would most likely have that umami flavor. So who wants to take the first shot? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, maybe one at a time. I heard like three things there. Um, what's first? Fish sauce. Fish sauce. Yep, yeah, that's good. All right, what else? Aged cheese. Aged cheese. Okay, what else? Tomato sauce. Tomato sauce. And sea salt. Nope, or is not sea salt. Unsaturated fat, I'm sorry. Nope, it's going to be ham. Ham bone. I didn't yeah. see that. Unless well, it, it mentions, um, I think it says something about like uh, bone broths. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, the stock's made from bones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's again, yeah, you got to be careful. 
Um, remember, you know, like sea salt is actual, you know, salty. That's that's its own flavor. Um, and it also talked about aged and, and cured things. So we have the aged cheese there, and then it references fish and, and tomatoes. So, all right, we should submit there. Yep, fish sauce, aged cheese, tomato sauce, and hampo. Okay. And number four. Okay, so paragraph two, uh, Sarah Wagner describes the type of American, oh, new, new passage. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, that's not umami. Okay, <clears throat> so here, uh, statement, buying American-made products, all right? Always remember the title. Uh, so paragraph one, Sarah Wagner's interest in American manufacturing began with a family road trip. She and her husband loaded up their motor home in summer 2011 and visited small towns across the country whose fate seemed to be tied to the presence of industry. So, you know, right off the top there, you know, we're looking at a category here. We know we're talking about American manufacturing. We know we're talking about um, where that's located across the country and, uh, you know, the presence of industry there. Uh, and then you know, moving forward, where plants and factories had closed down, they found empty main streets with boarded up storefronts. In other places, such as Forest City, Iowa, home to the Winnebago factory, they found vibrant communities where they could tour manufacturing facilities and witness the pride employees took in their work. When the trip was over, she started a Twitter account to share resources for all things made stateside. As USA Love List has, involved, has evolved into a website, Wagner has learned that even though she can find plenty of goods made in the United States, it's impossible to live off of them. Uh, but she said the holiday season is the perfect time to experiment with how far she can go. For the second year in a row, Wagner has pledged to buy as many gifts as possible made in the United States. Knowing where to start can be a challenge, but Wagner and others for whom conscious consumerism means buying American say there are many places to check out from craft fairs, Etsy, and specialty boutiques to e-commerce. Gift giving creates the perfect opportunity to try to buy American. You have extra time to research and you have flexibility in what you choose to buy, said the married mother of two from Philadelphia. I'm a realist. I know that it's impossible to buy entirely American-made products year-round, but I also know there's a lot of wonderful American-made products by proud Americans, and it's worth my time to look for them. Okay, so going on here on paragraph two, Sarah Wagner describes a type of American town with empty main streets. What do these towns have in common? Uh, they're in... Mm -hmm. D is in dog. They have lost manufacturing jobs, right? Uh, so nothing here really about farming. Uh, you know, some of them are uh, vibrant, but uh, what she's really dealing with here uh, is describing American towns. You know, we go back up here to sentence two, right? And right off the bat, right off the bat, you know, where plants and factories had closed down. They found empty main streets with boarded up storefronts. So D is in dog for number four. Okay. And yeah, all right. So question five. So in which category of town does the author place for a city? So is it a town with active community and successful industry? Town with an active community and strong service industry? vibrant town that thrives on tourism, or D, a thriving community similar to other such communities in Iowa? What do we have here for number five? B. Let's go with A, right? Because uh, Four City is where the Winnebago, Winnebago factory was. So that's actually a, a town that's thriving. It's doing well with American manufacturing, right? So A for that one. Okay. And here, number six. So according to the passage, who would best fit into the category of conscious consumer? Person who shops on e-commerce, a person who cares about how and where a product is made, 
a person who is flexible in what he or she buys or a person who knows where to buy American. C. It's, uh, it's B as a boy. Now, you know, she mentions being a conscious consumer looking uh, for American-made products, but all in all, uh, the idea is that it's someone who's, uh, you know, discerning and who's, you know, cares about how and where a product's made. Um, so B as in boy. Seven. So which best describes the category of a realist in this passage? A, people who try to buy American-made products when they can. B, people who claim that American-made products are superior. C, people who buy American-made products no matter how expensive. Or D, people who have the time and commitment to look for American-made products. D? It's A. So, you know, the idea of a realist is someone who's you know, uh, understands, right, that, you know, can't always have things your way. So people are trying to buy American-made products uh, when they can. So like right here at the end, she says, you know, I'm a realist. I know that it's impossible to buy entirely American-made products year-round. Um, so it's somebody that's going to look for them, but may not always acquire them, All right? All right, so seven is A. Okay. And in one last passage here, I think we'll have four questions to go along with this one. So title, uh, dealing with American-made products still, new popularity for American-made products. So motivated by desire to boost the des uh, domestic economy or doubts over outsourcing, some Americans are making an effort to shop local for holiday gifts this year. It's a niche market, but it's one that has been growing in recent years and brands are starting to take notice. A growing number of small companies have been catering to the desire for American-made clothing and accessories, fueled in large part by style blogs touting the benefits of heritage brands. On a larger scale, Apple announced that it would, thrift, uh, it would shift some of its production back to the United States, signing customer demand for American-made products. Though some have char uh, characterized the announcement as a publicity ploy that won't do much to alter Apple's manufacturing operations, it follows a continuing pattern of American companies bringing manufacturing back home due to rising labor, supply, and production costs in China. Some say buying American is a drop in the bucket when it comes to boosting the domestic economy, but experts agree that every bit counts. Manufacturing has the highest multiplier effect of any industry, meaning that it benefits other sectors that support its operations. Anytime something is manufactured in the United States, it's going to have greater gains in terms of jobs than something made overseas. And Chad Moutre, uh, chief economist for the National Association of Manufacturers. Electronics and appliances made in the United States are hard to come by, but jewelry, clothing, accessories, beauty products, even holiday decorations are easier to find than you think, uh, according to Sarah Wagner. Um, buying American for the holidays hasn't changed her budget significantly, she said. She'll spend about $700 on family, friends, and white elephant gifts, about the same as in recent years. The only differ difference is that she spends a bit more time searching. And for number eight, so according to this passage, which product best fits into the category of a heritage brand? Uh, a, a computer manufactured in China and used in the U.S. B, a sweater made in the U.S. by a long-standing American company. C, a shirt made in Italy and sold by an American company. Or D, a popular brand of jeans worn throughout the U.S. B, B as in boy. Yeah. So uh, again, you know, sort of uh, thinking about the title, thinking about uh, the content of that passage, uh, you could start really looking at B really quickly, right? As you're reading through them, that this makes sense. A heritage brand, well, that sounds like something that's going to be, you know, a, a long held American company makes its products here. You know, heritage has that ring to it. 
So you can kind of circle that. And as you go back and, and you're eliminating the other ones, you realize that it's going to be B. Okay, number nine. So which statement best explains, uh, explains how paragraph one and paragraph three are related? I don't think we need a the there. Uh, so A, paragraph one explains the concept of a niche market as it relates to American goods. B, the example of Apple in paragraph three contradicts the ideas of boosting the domestic economy mentioned in paragraph one. C, both paragraph one and paragraph three explain uh, growing trends and style. And D, paragraph three supports paragraph one by using Apple as an example of an industry heating customer demand for American goods. D? It is D, D is in dog. Paragraph three supports paragraph one. Uh, so it's saying here, you know, larger scale, Apple announced that it's shifting production back to the United States. So here, paragraph one, motivated by desire to boost the domestic economy or, or doubts of resource outsourcing, uh, Americans are making efforts. So Apple is trying to get back in to American manufacturing uh, because uh, Americans are looking more for American-made goods. Uh, but the, yeah, then it does give that caveat that, you know, even though it's bringing back some of its manufacturing, most of it is still um, produced overseas. <clears throat> and then the author claims on number 10, the author claims that manufacturing is the category of industry that has the greatest impact on creating American jobs. Which detail in the passage best supports its claim? Uh, a, manufacturing benefits other sectors of the economy that supports its operations. B, Apple is shifting some production back. C, labor supply and production costs are rising in China. Or D, a growing number of small companies have been catering to the desire for American-made clothing and accessories. Which one we want to go to there? Me. It's A. A. Yeah. Mm. Manufacturing benefits. Right. So A there. And our last one. According to the passage, which American made product would be hardest to find? So a, a, a silver bracelet, B, a pair of cowboy boots, C, a digital camera, D, a wool scarf. Up here, a? C is in cat. Yeah, so it says here on, in paragraph set six, electronics and appliances made in the United States are hard to come by. Uh, so C, for 11, okay, and let me give you guys the answers here, make sure everybody's caught up. Uh, so one was B as in boy, two is C for cat. Then we had our little web of information. So that's fish sauce, um, aged cheese, tomato sauce, and ham bone. Four is D, five is A, six is B, seven is A, eight is B, nine is D, 10 is A, and 11 is C. Okay. 